I'm hearing a little bit of noise in the background, but uh, I just want to say thank you so much for being here. Welcome. My name is Dr. Tiffany Butler, the Associate Vice Chancellor for Educational Equity in the Division of Diversity, Inclusion, and Community Engagement. My pronouns are she, her, and hers, and welcome to the first Equity Mindset Workshop Series. And so the goal for today is to be able to, the goal for the workshop series is to be able to build uh, critical skill sets for um, building an equity mindset. And so that no matter where we sit around the institution, that we're building skills to be able to support student success in a variety of different ways. And so today, this afternoon, um, we're going to learn about strategies to support neurodiverse students uh, by Dr. Christopher Menente, the Executive Director of the Center for Adult Autism Services, as well as Mr. Ian uh, Bober, Senior Program Coordinator for the Center for Adult Autism Services. So I hope that you enjoy, that you engage. Um, for the folks who are online, you can feel free to put questions in the chat. We will have someone monitoring. And so the aim is to be able to have a little bit of a dialogue um, throughout, I think at the preference of our speakers, but also we will have a formal Q&A at the end. So if you're feeling like you just want to wait into the Q&A, you surely can do that. And so again, on behalf of uh, our Senior Vice President for Equity, Dr. Enobong Anna Branch, welcome to the Ed Equity, uh, Equity Mindset Workshop Series 2023. Thanks. So we do have a recording disclaimer. Um, we will be recording, and so for the folks who are online, uh, we are recording to be able to make this um, something that you can use as a resource, right? Something to refer back to. Um, for the folks who are in the room, um, we will be taking some periodic pictures, but likely it'll be more aimed toward the front, so just as an indicator, um, we will be recording. So as an acknowledgement, we want to acknowledge the land uh, for which we live and work as the ancestral territory of the Lenape people. We respect the indigenous people throughout the Lenape diaspora, past, present, and future. And uh, we understand and respect historically and systematically how they've been disenfranchised. We also acknowledge that Rutgers University, as well as New Jersey and the United States as a nation, was founded upon the exclusions and erasures of those indigenous peoples. And so recognizing as a community acknowledgement, I think this is probably one of the things that we have added into uh, every workshop that we do in this kind of context. It's just acknowledge the things that are going on. Folks are coming with all manner of things, all uh, situations, um, things uh, that we know about or and don't know about. And so we thank you for being in community with us, both in person, taking some time away from your day to eat and fellowship with us, but also for the folks who are online to take time to be able to spend uh, in community together. So I think I would be remiss, and I wouldn't be myself if I didn't give you an agenda. I think that's very core to who I am. <laughs> um, so I just did the welcome, and uh, shortly I'll introduce our speakers. Uh, and the keynotes who will be presenting today will talk a little bit about the strategies um, for student success uh, uh, related to neurodiverse students. Then I mentioned previously that we'll have a Q&A, a formal Q&A, but again, if you're having questions throughout, you surely can, and can ask, uh, particularly even if you're online, you can go ahead and use that chat function, and then we will dismiss, and then we'll have a chat and chew for the folks who are in the room. So let me go ahead and introduce our speakers. So uh, Dr. Christopher Menente uh, is the founding executive director for the Rutgers Center for Autism, Adult Autism Services and is an associate professor of clinical practice at the Rutgers Graduate School of Applied Professional Psychology. Dr. Menente's previous roles include serving as an assistant professor of education at Caldwell University, as a consultant supporting students with ASD in schools throughout New Jersey, and uh, serving as a senior program coordinator of adult services in the Douglas De Developmental Disability Center at Rutgers University. Dr. Menente has authored uh, several um, peer-reviewed journals, co-authored book chapters, and has presented at numerous local and national conferences on a variety of topics related to the advancement of community-based education, vocational, and residential opportunities for older adult learners with autism. Additionally, we'll also hear from Ian Bober. Um, he has a long history of working with autistic children and adults at Rutgers University. After starting as a preschool classroom assistant uh, at the Douglas Developmental Disability Center's Douglas School, Mr. Bober went on to serve as program coordinator for the, adult, uh, adult, uh, for the Douglas Adult Program. 
He oversaw all clinical activities specializing in ABA-based vocational and life skills training for adults with autism, as well as the developmental and implementation of the intervention for challenging behaviors. Mr. Boebert came uh, to our CAAS in 2019 to work with the SCALE program as a behavioral technician and then as the acting supervisor of the behavioral analyst uh, for the program. In the summer of 2022, Mr. Bober accepted the position of senior program coordinator um, for the CSP where he now oversees all operations in the facilitation of academic and social support for enrolled Rutgers, Rutgers University undergraduates on the autism spectrum. So if you could give, me, give a hand as they come up to speak. Hi everyone. So first, I just want to set some expectations. Um, expectation one, this is an enormous topic, and an hour is not enough time, right? And, and so um, for Ian and I, we would actually um, love more of a dialogue than just you know, us kind of being the sole source of information speaking directly at you. Because again, there's, there's so much going on in this space, both at Rutgers, nationally, individually, for neurodiverse students, their faculty, um, neurodiverse people who are faculty, neurodiverse people who are employees here at the university. You know, we would love to hear from all of you um, who are here present and in person and um, virtually, um, you know, if, if you are currently trying to navigate um, any complex issues or situations that you'd like to offer um, to the group for exploration. Um, we'd love to use this as a working meeting. You know, that, that said, we'll actually um, begin our, our talk just kind of giving you the lay of the land. For those of you that don't have um, much of an existing background uh, in this space. But, you know, that said as well, please feel free to interrupt, right? Please feel free to raise your hand, ask questions. We can, um, you know, um, divert from the, the, the PowerPoint slides. All of that is fair game, okay? So, um, first things first, from all of you in the room, you know, what, what is your conception of what it means to have a disability? And why do you think I write the word disability this way? Yeah. Um, trying to put this succinctly, um, I work with students with disabilities in like a career preparedness perspective or capacity, and uh, many times it's it's more external barriers to success uh, rather than something that's inherently quote unquote wrong with the individual or the person. So it's there's nothing like dis inherently dysfunctional about a human being like like we are all inherently like gifted and talented but external factors come into play that just make it more challenging for us to ex express our talents and our abilities wonderful well said anyone else have anything to add yes please i would say perhaps uh, students or individuals who whose normal operating, living activities of daily living are perhaps different than what the averages or the norms may be. Different. I like that word. That's, that's helpful for sure. Anyone else? What does it mean to have a disability? So I agree with everything that's been said. Um, and it, it, you know, none of this is going to capture the sheer complexity of, of what this means for someone at the individual level, because fundamentally we are all different. Uh, but I, I love um, kind of the differentiation between inherent traits of an individual and um, kind of societal or institutional structures that may put that individual at a disadvantage um, that kind of exist in that person's work or learning environment. I think that's a really critical distinction uh, to make. And so the reason I write disability this way is because our, our society, 
our institutions, including our university here at Rutgers, um, often kind of um, adopts a deficit focus, right? We are very focused on the things that people can't do, right? And we often ignore all of the abilities of that same person if those abilities don't fit the typical mold of what society or institutions or Rutgers University is looking for in terms of kind of the, the profile of a successful student, right? The portrait of a learner. Like what is the portrait of a successful student at Rutgers, right? And, and I think historically that portrait of a learner hasn't really included neurodiverse students, right? It would be more um, students who can sit still quietly and be passive recipients of information that comes directly from their professor. And look, every classroom at Rutgers is different. We have some great faculty who are super engaging, but sometimes just the structural design of those classrooms don't allow for like a dialectical approach to teaching. If you have an undergraduate course with 300 plus students, right, that's not always going to be possible. Right? So it, it's th this is a matter of scale. Right, there are different institutional and structural factors at different points of scale that might disadvantage individual neurodiverse students. But broadly, the whole system um, you know, is not serving neurodiverse people well. And I, I think the animal school, which is depicted here, actually provides like a, a really nice kind of representation of what's happening. See, in the animal school, the professor sits at the front of the class and they um, kind of establish what the most valuable traits and performance indicators are for the students in their class based on what's important to them, based on their cultural and behavioral norms, their prior education and experiences, right? And often they don't consider, you know, all of those identity traits for the students in their class when determining like what it is of most value for those students to learn and how to evaluate whether they've learned, right? And so you know, consider, you know, the, the, the poor fish in this classroom, right? So today the professor has decided that the classroom will be judged on its ability, all students in the class will be judged on their ability to climb a tree, right? The fish is a perfect fish, right? The fish um, does everything a fish should do extremely well. The fish is in the 99th percentile in all aspects of being a fish, right? But when it comes to being judged, you know, by the norms uh, and academic and or behavioral expectations of this particular professor who is not a fish, right, the fish will fail miserably. And the fish will live its life believing that it's stupid. Even though it's a perfect fish. It's not broken, right, it doesn't need to be cured or fixed, right. It's just always going to be at a disadvantage in this particular classroom. And when all of our institutions in all of our classrooms are set up this way, and when neurodiverse people are the fish in the class, it's unlikely um, that they'll ever have a fair chance to succeed. So, and here's, here's how this plays out um, by the numbers, right? And um, so the, the number of neurodiverse students, and when we're talking about neurodiverse students, this includes people who have um, diagnoses and classifications including autism, um, ADHD, dyslexia, dysgraphia, dyscalculia, um, and others, right? So these, these folks are attending colleges and universities in record numbers, right? But they're also failing to complete their college education um, at startling rates, far below, um, you know, their, their neurotypical peers, right? And so neurodiverse students have far worse outcomes at colleges and universities across a number of um, different measures, um, you know, in including um, academic performance, interpersonal relationships, mental health, physical health, and often report having very high levels of anxiety, loneliness, and depression. Uh, and so one of the big issues here, too, um, is, is self-identification of disability is often the only way that students can get additional supports or get plugged into communities at universities where they might actually receive help. Um, and that's, that's kind of a, um, you know, a lose-lose game for those students because there's also these structures where of, of like ableism and discrimination surrounding 
the student's status of being someone with a disability, right? We have that deficit focus, right? The second you raise your hand and say, hey, I have autism, people are already trying to figure out all of the things you can't do, and there's a lot of stigma um, that exists around having autism. Like it's, it's very unlikely that someone would raise their hand and self-identify unless they're already struggling, right? This is a huge challenge for us at Rutgers in particular, um, but at all um, institutions of higher education, where there's really less of um, um, you know, a, a community feeling like people who are neurodiverse, people with autism, are welcome um, and embraced, and more that they're tolerated, right? So if you have autism and you come here, don't worry, you can stay. And if you get, if, if, if you start failing or you're, you're in crisis, uh, mental health-wise or interpersonally, there are people you can call, right? But that, that is a very um, distinct arrangement than you know, Rutgers and other universities standing up and saying, hey, we want you here. Hey, we want you to come here. Hey, we're going to market that we are the place for neurodiverse people and autistic students to come. Um, and look, we're, we're absolutely moving in that direction. Um, and I'm really speaking in historical terms that this is the way it has been really up until now. You know, over the last you know, year or two um, at Rutgers, you know, these, these are like still some of the very first conversations we're having about neurodiversity um, within, you know, the larger conversation of equity and inclusion in our institution. So, and the other thing is, um, so a lot because of this stigma that exists and kind of the, the, the losing, um, you know, arrangement of self-identification, a lot of students are in a position to have to hide who they are, right? And this is often referred to as masking. Um, which, you know, really takes an incredible toll. Um, it's exhausting to constantly pretend you're someone you're not just in order to survive. Um, and then there are, like, really deep-seated implications uh, in, in doing that, too, in terms of long-term mental health. Um, because, essentially, that, that sends an implicit and sometimes explicit message that who you are really is not okay and you need to pretend to be someone else, someone who's actually valued um, where you go to school. Right, and so the lack of uh, college and university completion for neurodiverse and, and autistic students in particular has really startling outcomes in terms of lifespan quality of life. Um, and that comes, uh, you know, those, those statistics that we now have, um, you know, they, um, you know, are, are relevant to a lack of options for independent living, um, a lack of employment, um, you know, a lot of our students have um, some difficulty in terms of um, social awareness and can be vulnerable and can be easily taken advantage of. Um, it's something we manage a lot um, here at Rutgers on campus in our students navigating our community. Um, and many folks on the spectrum are victims of some form of abuse at some point. Um, again, high rates of depression, high rates of suicide, um, and just really, again, a shortened lifespan overall for people with autism, uh, which for me is always painful to even have to say out loud because autism doesn't kill people. Fundamentally, autism is not a disease or an illness that makes people sick or causes tissue damage, right? I think there's no clearer um, depiction of the, you know, really deep-seated historical institutional discriminatory factors that exist for the 5.5 plus million people with autism living in the U.S. Um, than this statistic that shows that en masse um, folks with autism have about half the life expectancy as compared to neurotypical people in the United States and it is just not acceptable. So that brings us to the concept of neurodiversity. So neurodiversity is kind of the opposite of ableism. So in an ableist mindset, um, not only do we um, view people um, for in a deficit lens for and, and really focus on what they can't do, right, and then differentiate access to opportunities based on what they can't do, right, in a discriminatory way. So you can't do all of this stuff, so you can't be a student. You can't do all this stuff, so you'll never be an employee, right? So neurodiversity also recognizes differences between people um, but it, it sees those differences as something that is inherent kind of in, in the human species. That all of our, our brains work differently. 
Um, and, and that is okay. It's part of the normal um, diversity amongst humans. And instead of having a deficit mindset, um, neurodiversity really um, requires people to focus on what people's abilities are and how they can succeed, right? In, in a neurodiversity mindset, um, hopefully society continues to evolve to where there aren't all of these barriers to where being neurodiverse would represent a disability. Um, and again, simply defined, a disability is when someone is at a marked disadvantage in, one, in some particular context um, for success. And so the founding of the Rutgers Center for Adult Autism Services is certainly one tangible, um, you know, um, some evident evidence point of how Rutgers is really, you know, moving the needle on neurodiversity. And you can see our, our president, Holloway, um, and uh, Chancellor Conway here cutting the ribbon on this beautiful building you're sitting in. And so for those of you that are joining us virtually, here are a couple of pictures of the building uh, that we're presenting from now. And so the Rutgers Center for Adult Autism Services currently has four units, right? So um, the college support program run by Ian, Ian Bover, who you're going to hear from in a minute, is one of those four units. We also have... Um, comprehensive uh, lifespan support for adults with autism across the spectrum who aren't necessarily college students um, or, or have never been. We also have clinical psychological services to address co-occurring anxiety and depression um, for people with autism. And we also have our newly launched intensive outpatient clinic um, you know, that supports adults with autism um, with severe uh, behavioral and adaptive challenges. And so each of our four units adhere to a three-pronged mission of service, training, and research. So we're not just helping people with autism directly. Um, we're also training practitioners who want to learn how to do this work and then publishing research on best practices. And so this is um, right on the landing page of the RCIS website. There's incredible information about each of our four units there for anyone who wants um, to learn more about what we do every day. So not only has the RCIS um, been a huge step forward for Rutgers, um, but as of last year, um, through an IDA uh, innovation grant provided through DICE, um, we have founded the Rutgers Neurodiversity Task Force, which is a collection of about two dozen uh, leaders across roles, including students, staff, and faculty from a number of different academic departments, units, and other organizations on campus, um, who have all come together to really push this mission of greater access accepta and acceptance um, for neurodiverse people at our university. We also um, help to get our students and other program participants employed in a wide range of settings on and off campus. And so now it is my pleasure to hand it over uh, to, to Ian Bober, who is, um, again, the senior program coordinator of our college support program here at the RCAS. And so Ian's going to be talking about that program in detail. Um, and then we'll pause um, to see if anyone has any questions or any specific situations that they'd like Ian and I um, to address and discuss. Um, and then we also have some case examples of situations that we've actually encountered between faculty and neurodiverse students here at Rutgers over the past year that we'd be willing to share. All right, here you go. Thank you very much. Thanks, Chris. It's a tough act to follow. Oh, thank you. See, it follows me and makes it go quicker. All right. So my name is Ian Bober. I'm the Senior Program co Coordinator for the uh, College Support Program. And uh, what we do is we are a comprehensive, integrated support for Rutgers students on the autism spectrum. The goals of the college support program is um, to provide a comprehensive support to Rutgers students, families, peer mentors, participating in the CSP that evolves and grows, sorry, with the students' needs. And to assist the university in creating an inclusive campus that that Chris was referring to before. Um, although a CSP provides support across a variety of student needs, 
Um, these are the main support systems we have in place for the program, which is not to say that these are the only forms of support. Um, so we have weekly meetings with a supportive CSP coordinator. I'm a coordinator myself, so I meet with students. Um, we have weekly meetings with peer mentors. So each of our students uh, are matched up with two peer mentors that they meet with for uh, minimally an hour a week. Um, and these are undergraduate students at Rutgers. We host social events here. Um, we do things like cooking demos and uh, movie nights and things like that where the whole um, program gets together, um, as many as will <laughs> attend anyway, um, to kind of meet as a community. Um, and so they can see their familiar um, faces that uh, you know, they can see out on campus and, and know that they have a more welcoming environment. Um, we, uh, we provide academic supports that can take different forms. Um, and we, uh, we support um, connections with campus resources. So these are some of the campus resources that we do connect with. It might be a little light there, but I'll explain them to you. Um, uh, student health, the police, dean of students, academic advising, ODS, the, the Office of Disability Services. We talk to professors a lot. Um, learning centers uh, where they can find writing, uh, writing tutors and tutors of, of different, um, you know, in all the different subject areas. Um, we coordinate with Career Exploration and Success Department here at Rutgers. Um, we, uh, we coordinate with Residence Life to help, uh, to help our students in that area, and also with the Counseling Centers, CAPS, uh, to provide some mental health supports. So we work as a hub, basically, to connect our students with all these different partners, all these different um, supports that are available here at Rutgers. So in the center, you see the basic structure of our support. S we meet, our students will meet with their coordinator for about an hour a week. Um, academic coaching, they're each assigned an academic coach that comes from the learning centers. Um, that's another hour a week, and I'll go into um, these supports in, details in, a minute, in detail in a minute. Um, our students, uh, they come to a study session for two hours a week here at the center, many times in this room, um, where... Um, Coordinators and, and, and peer mentors will be present to help them um, basically work on the study skills that they might learn uh, from their academic coach. Um, that's a support that can fade out as students demonstrate success. Um, and all our supports are really designed to kind of fade out because we don't want to provide a full gamut of support right into senior year and then basically they fall off the supports cliff. Um, so we do we do implement each of these aspects with the intention of fading a, as, as success is demonstrated. Um, peer mentors, like I said, these are undergrads that meet two hours a week, and then social events. So that's the main crux of the program. Um, we do other things, but this is, this is a nice, concise list. Um, so our weekly coordinator meeting. It's about 45 minutes to an hour, sometimes two hours, um, per week at the RCAS Community Center. Um, so each of our students have to come to this one. Th this is the main support. Um, and uh, our coordinators, uh, myself, we have an assistant program coordinator, and then we also um, have four or five um, social worker um, graduate students, social work gra graduate students that work for us for the entire year, and they all have their own caseload. Um, we train them up in the summer, um, and then we, we match them up with, uh, with four or five of our 30 students. Um, so I didn't mention that before. We have about 30 students. That's our capacity for the time being. As Chris mentioned before, we would like to grow, but we're kind of staying at that, at that level for at least the next year. Um, with that 30 stu uh, students, that means 60 peer mentors or the undergraduate volunteers. So we, we're always looking for peer mentors because um, that's, a, that's a lot of people. Um, so this is our main check-in meeting. Um, the coordinator will, re will review all supports that a student are connected to at Rutgers. So some students don't receive a lot of uh, supports. Um, some, receive a lot, uh, some do receive a lot of supports. Um, and the coordinator and student will review all their cases, all their classes individually and update their assignment in exam logs. So basically we, we keep track, we help the student keep track of a lot of their, the place that they're spinning, basically. College life can be very complicated. Um, we have, we do focus very much on academics because that is kind of the, you know, the main ring of the circus um, where if, if that's not, um, if success isn't, isn't happening there, that, that 
basically, um, you know, would really affect <laughs> their college life, let's say. Um, and we troubleshoot. We do a lot of troubleshooting. Um, every student has a different experience, and so, you know, every meeting is going to be addressing basically how, how do we promote the most success in, in whatever area is, is most challenging at the moment. Um, and we, we spend a lot of time, again, facilitating those connections. A lot of, um, a lot of work practicing how to write emails to professors, how to talk to professors who are really not understanding the situation that's going on. Um, you know, if students are, are um, experiencing executive functioning challenges, which are, which are very common, um, you know, they might be missing assignments, things like that. We can kind of work to smooth things over a bit, you know, and, and make, things, uh, make things go a little bit better. Um, and pr most professors are pretty open to work with us, um, and we, we, we want all professors to be <laughs> very open, but that's not always the case, unfortunately. Um, so our weekly peer mentor meetings, students are matched with two peer mentors, like I said, um, and these are undergraduates who are, are unpaid, um, that are, are at least sophomores, um, that are uh, that we reach out to, um, you know, uh, with recruiting flyers, and we re reach out to the uh, certain uh, academic departments, um, and uh, these students are, are interested in working with us just basically to learn. Yes. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> Thank you very much. I, I felt myself popping a little bit. Um, for mic control. Uh, so students are matched with two peer mentors. Uh, so these are undergraduates that are basically um, interested in learning about autism and learning about uh, and, and willing to give to the community. Um, they are basically altruistic. Uh, and uh, we really respect and, and rely on them to be one of the major uh, backbones of our support. Um, so the students are, are expected to meet with both of their peer mentors for a minimum of one hour a week. And this can be difficult because many of our students have not so much interest in socializing, because it can be difficult. Um, but this is a step towards getting connected to, to the, the, the Rutgers social scene, basically. Um, you know, our peer mentors are understanding, they're going to listen, um, they're going to, uh, you know, they're going to be expecting some challenges uh, when socializing. And basically, this, this is social time. You know, this is not work time, this isn't a tutoring session. Um, They'll hang out, they'll get a bite to eat. Um, some some uh, peer mentor meetings will take place here. They'll just play board games or video games or basically some sort of structured activity where you know, friendship um, can kind of develop and, and socializing can be uh, supported. Um, sometimes just go for a walk, get food together, explore the campus. Um, our peer mentors will help students find out where certain buildings are, find out where to get the bite, a bite to eat. Sometimes if it's their first time on Bush campus, a peer mentor will go with them. You know, so it's, it's, um, it can take all different forms. Uh, it can be tricky to, to manage and to coordinate because we have students, you know, uh, young students that they, they can be flaky, <laughs> let's, let, let's be honest. Um, and that, that's where um, the CSP students coordinator kind of comes in to make sure that these relationships are being maintained. Um, we have monthly social events. <laughs> these are events that are held once a month. Uh, our students are expected to attend a minimum, minimum of two per semester. Um, and they can be themed about what's going on during the calendar year, it's a general get together. Um, this can be things like campus spirit night, a Halloween party, cooking demos, um, game night, etc. cetera. And uh, you know, we usually have about 20 or 30 of the, you know, of the CSP community here that includes students and peer mentors. Um, so these, these can be Larger gatherings, sometimes, you know, turnout can be a little smaller or larger depending on if it's exam week or, or whatever. Um, and uh, these events may also collaborate with other campus organizations. So, for example, the Camp Companion Animal Club, we've had, we've had uh, service dogs and training here. Um, and we've, have, uh, we've had a recent uh, collaboration with Rutgers Dining, where, we, where two chefs have come over from, from dining services and put on a cooking demo. With, with meals. So that was a pretty cool event that we hope to foster that, that relationship with Rutgers Dining. Um, and so, like I said, the events are held right here at the community center. We take advantage of our, our great living room, the games room, the entertainment lounge we have over there with lots of consoles and TVs, um, and, uh, and the, the awesome kitchen that we have over there as well. Um, 
you know, our students are welcome to come by just about any time to, to use this somewhat underused, awesome kitchen. <laughs> um, weekly academic coaching meetings. All right, so this is getting back to more ac academics. We coordinate these with uh, learning specialists from the learning centers. These are academic coaches. Um, 45 minutes to an, or to an hour per week. They don't take place here. They usually take place at the various learning centers um, on the different campuses. Um, at these meetings, the students and the, co and the coaches will address study skills, organization strategies, time management strategies. So there's some overlap that occurs at these academic coaching meetings um, and the coordinator meetings. We, we communicate with these academic coaches. We tell, tell the academic coaches uh, what important assignments are coming up. This guy's got a 10-page paper due in a week. What can we do to block out some time? And these uh, academic coaches are very skilled in uh, coming up with a certain stu study strategies that um, you know, will be successful. Um, okay, so again, we help the students set up all these meetings as well because that can be a major challenge, just knowing where these things are on Rutgers. So again, we're the hub that connects our students to partners like this. We have weekly study sessions here, um, two hours per week. Um, students can work on any homework projects, they can do readings, they can study for the classes. Um, and uh, they should be practicing the skills that they're learning at their academic study sessions, their academic coaching studies, uh, coaching sessions rather. A CSP staff member will be present at all the study sessions to help troubleshoot general problems. We don't go into uh, content-specific tutoring or anything like that, but just make sure that students are properly studying, basically, and demonstrating the, the skills that they need. Um, if it seems like a student's struggling academically, we can, we can require that they come for more study sessions. Um, some students do check out, and we need to make sure that at least they're spending two, four hours a, a week addressing their, um, their studies. And by check out, I mean, like, become disengaged with their studies because of all the challenges that, that they're encounter, encountering. Um, and there's always something to do at these study sessions. Um, students do come in sometimes and say, I don't have any homework, which is kind of ridiculous. <laughs> um, okay, so let's, uh, let's pause for a second and we can, uh, we can open up to questions just uh, based on what um, what we discussed so far, what Chris's, uh, Chris's section, my, uh, my spiel about our program. And just one last uh, point of clarification on the college support program. Uh, so this is a supplemental service that students have to pay for out of pocket. And the way that it works is students are accepted for admission to Rutgers University under their own academic uh, volition. Right, and then there's a secondary application process to be admitted to the college support program. So unfortunately, at this time, when we're supporting um, faculty or um, academic administrators, you know, it's typically only in relation to students who are directly in our program, right? Where we would love to see this go one day um, is for Rutgers to invest in the expansion of our program where we can be a resource to academic administrators and faculty and students throughout our university just and, and beyond um, just the 30 students um, that we currently support. And I, I meant to say earlier um, that right now, even through self-identification um, via the Office of Disability Services, ODS, you know, we, um, you know, we estimate that there's at least about 10,000 students who identify as neurodiverse at Rutgers. So, we're really, in, in serving just 30, um, we're really just um, serving just a, a tiny proportion of the student body um, that would probably benefit from our help. So I have a question from the chat. Um, how do you create a more inclusive mindset and actively practice being more inclusive in a classroom as an instructor while operating within a disabling neurotypical framework or context, which is our current educational system. Can I take it? Sure. Yeah, so, so I, I think, um, you know, we, we can't make, uh, you know, 180 degree transformational changes to the institution by flipping a switch. So there's always going to be 
some limitation to what an individual faculty member can accomplish in terms of um, like changing the norms and expectations of our higher ed system. Um, that said, I, like small things like being flexible and accepting um, to um, you know people who don't learn by sitting still quietly. You know, if 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 there are students who need to um, get up and and move around um, during class, and this is just a a single four instance, right? Um, you know, instead of a, a, a professor um, seeing that as a, a signal of opposition or like a behavioral or a compliance issue, you know, that, that professor, um, so I, I think something I, I try and always uh, say to people is like always assume the best, never assume the worst, right? Because um, assuming the worst is like this student is trying to disrespect me or this student doesn't really want to be here or this student doesn't care about what I have to say, right? Those, that would be examples of assuming the worst, when a student is up out of their seat and walking around and isn't, isn't um, learning in the traditional neurotypical behavior norm focused kind of way. Whereas assuming the best would be like, hey, this student is doing exactly what they need to to give me their full attention right now, right? And, and I think um, doing their, do, uh, faculty can do their best um, not to engage in um, responses that are stigmatizing, like in this one, for instance, that I'm providing, like calling that student out in front of all of their peers in a way that they're exerting their authority to try and get compliance in the moment, but instead waiting till after class to have a, 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 a private and respectful conversation um, with the student that also doesn't start with the tone of authority and compliance and punitive consequences, but hey, is there anything I can do to help you succeed in my course? Like that's how that conversation should start. Like, hey, you were being really disruptive and distracting to me. Like that's, that's how it shouldn't start. So again, I think being accepting, being flexible, asking an individual person how you can help them. Um, you know, again, all within the confines of our institutional system, which will have limits. Elizabeth, do you have a question? Yeah, uh, can you speak into the mic just a little so folks... Is this going to yeah. talk into this? Yeah. Mic? Okay, I did not go to this college, but I went to college. <laughs> um, I, w I would say what I wish college professor has done was just, like, when you're starting a class, just ask everybody what they need anonymously. Like, just say, what does everyone need? Because universal designs is really important, and it doesn't single anyone out, plus some people are not even going to tell you. So if you just say like, okay, w what kind of things do you need? And you can start naming things like, do you need to stand up? Do you need to do this? Do you need to do that? And then have them write to you or, I don't know, <laughs> write it down or something. And then you could, you could know what they need because everybody learns differently. Neurodiversity is not specific. Like people think that's just autism. It's not like, I don't know what the statistics are, but at least you count ADHD. If you count Tourette's syndrome, then you can even go into mental health. Like everybody's neurodiversity so everybody needs something. Like, why can't you just have fidgets out in your classroom? Why can't people draw when you're talking? Like, as long as you're not disruptive. But I don't think people set out to be disruptive. And that's the thing about neurodiversity as well, is that if you don't say you have autism, you have ADHD or something, then they just call you bad, stupid, dumb. They're going to label you anyway. <laughs> so sometimes it's better to say things, but then you also get the backlash of, Brilliant, yeah, thank you. And I, I think that's, um, to build off Eliz Elizabeth's point, is essentially just make your classroom a safe space where people feel comfortable asking for what they need. And um, as a faculty member, you have to remember that fair is not that everyone gets the same, but that everyone gets what they need to succeed. If you could build a, um, just a little bit on the peer mentor system. So I notice you have two peer mentors. Typically, there's typically a one-to-one. -one. Um, just wanted to hear a little bit more about what the process was behind that. Sure, sure. Um, so basically, we, we recruit at least 60 peer mentors to have going into the semester so that we can pair um, so we can assign two peer mentors to each of our students. And we look for common interests, you know, for, for instance, uh, similar uh, areas of study, um, similar, um, you know, 
leisure activities that they're into, if they're into games or D&D, &D, so oh, this would be a perfect match for so-and-so. Um, so we, we, during the interview process, we're kind of thinking, with the peer mentors, we're kind of thinking, like, who would this guy be good with? Um, and uh, where it goes from there is we, we connect the student and the peer mentors at the beginning of the semester um, via email or we have them come in to meet, uh, depending on what, what the student prefers or needs as far as you know, us fostering that connection. Um, and then they can meet here or we can just, uh, we can uh, set up a connection uh, to you know, get a bite to eat at Broward Commons if they're going there anyway. We try to make this as easy as possible for the student because if there's too much effort, we're gonna get resistance. And that is a common problem with, uh, with any of our supports is that sometimes our students don't want to participate. Um, so um, from there, you know, the, the, the hope is that, you know, our peer mentors will kind of take the reins a bit um, and, and try to uh, find ways and in common interests that they can uh, make that connection for the next meeting. Every, every week we try to connect to the next meeting and have that um, on the calendar. Um, you know, we're going we're gonna to hang out at, you know, at RCAS next week. We're going to cook up some burgers. Um, it can be tough when uh, rapport isn't being built naturally and, that, and we have the capacity to, you know, our, we encourage our students to, to talk to us about it and, you know, if, if we have the ability, maybe we'll swap um, peer mentors across students if, if that makes sense. Um, we try to keep a couple peer mentors on deck, um, you know, as a, a substitute, <laughs> basically. Um, peer mentors will drop out of the program in the middle of the semester sometimes. I mean, this is, these are 60 college kids. They can be volatile. Um, and um, we also have an executive board. These are peer mentors who have been with us for at least a year, and we have six positions, like president, co-president, um, secretary, um, treasurer, for, you know, to try to uh, uh, run fundraisers for our, our, um, for our events. Um, we, don't, we don't receive much money, <laughs> you know, or any money, basically, to run these things. So, so they're, they're kind of, uh, we're kind of relying on the money that we can generate ourselves with small fundraisers, like, uh, you know, uh, we had a, an event with Honey Grow or, um, or Qdoba. Um, and um, we also have, a, what else do we have with the peer mentors? So, so the peer mentors on mass kind of report to the executive board that we have, which is overseen by our uh, assistant program coordinator, Aaron Walker, who's, who's my partner in crime. Um, and that's basically the shape of the peer mentor system. Uh, I, I hope that answers your question. Yeah, and so you can think of it um, almost in the sense of like a student club, um, you know, which is a direction we may formally go. Um, but the other, the other thing I'll ask all of you in the room is like, what does it mean to have a friend? Right, what does friendship mean? And, and something that, that uh, Ian said earlier, I just, I wanna amplify a little bit. Um, there's a common misconception that um, people with autism don't want friends, right? Um, and that is almost always the farthest thing from the truth. Um, but it doesn't change the fact that social interaction can be extremely laborious um, for many folks on the spectrum. Um, and also, again, um, all of our conceptions of what it means to have a friend is very different, right? So when we're, we're thinking about the peer mentorship model, you know, we're not, we're not just trying to manufacture friendships. Like genuine friendships often do result um, from this arrangement, but really we're, we're trying to help that student kind of plug in to the social structure of Rutgers in a way where they get the absolute most value out of their time spent here as a student versus feeling socially isolated and not knowing how to kind of engage and connect with the campus community. And the other thing is, you know, we're really trying to set our students up for success post-graduation, as, as, as Ian said. And many of our students are truly academically gifted. Twice exceptional is, is a term, 2E is a term um, that you, you, you may have heard before um, to refer to students who have some um, form of disability diagnosis but also have enormous gifts. Um, and, and so um, this, this, is, this is really complex because students who are twice exceptional, who are really gifted in one particular domain, one particular discipline, might know everything about combustion engines or aerospace engineering. I think sometimes that's all they want to talk about. And even, even when speaking with other people who share their interests, they may have a really difficult time um, like communicating their thoughts and opinions um, and also influencing others. So we want to set up our students not only to be, you know, excellent employees in their chosen fields, 
but we want them to have the opportunity to reach their full potential, whatever that means for that person, and even assume very high level uh, leadership positions um, in organizations that they, they want to be a part of in the future. Of course, always. It only took eight minutes. Um, yeah. <laughs> what? <laughs> no, I was gonna say about mentoring. Like, obviously, that's not a friendship. It's it's like you know, together. But like when I started working in workplaces, like having a mentor in a workplace is also really important because that person shows you how to navigate the environment. So having a, even if you're not the best friends or friendship doesn't develop with that peer, they can at least show you where the dining hall is or the club or this, and kind of you can make your own friends from that. So at least they're helping you navigate things. Awesome. That, that's absolutely right. And, and sometimes these peer mentor relationships are a little bit more utilitarian. <laughs> like, I, I really don't know. Oh, just, just less about having fun and more about how do I work college. <laughs> Yeah, it oh. serves, serves a really objective function. Like it helps you get from here to there or learn. Yeah. Hey, Elizabeth, can you just like what? 30 seconds tell <laughs> everyone who you are and you know, you've been, ha you've been hanging out at our, our center oh, for a, a couple weeks now and yeah. Okay. Let's introduce yourself, 30 seconds. I am taking over the show. No, no, no. Okay, I'm Elizabeth. Um, so I don't actually go here. Um, I have autism and I've been part of Rutgers in different ways. So like they have a peer social group, I've done that. I've been part of a research day, I've consulted on things. So I've known Christopher and people for a while. Recently, I lost a job and didn't know what to do with myself. And so I came to talk to Christopher about it and he said, cause I'm really good at art. Like, why don't you just do art, art for the building? So I've been camping out in the chair over there for like the past couple weeks. And I'm gonna continue this up until the neurodiversity conference where I'm gonna talk about my artwork and the process of making it, but also just about what I observe in the community and interactions of this community center because I'm literally just sitting here doing that here every day. Awesome, <laughs> that, that, that's great. And, and so um, just that's a great jumping off point so I don't forget to blurt it out. <laughs> right, our, our second annual Rutgers Neurodiversity Summit um, is confirmed for Thursday, June 15th um, to be held in person right here at the RCAS and also um, streaming uh, virtually in real time. Um, so for those of you that are joining us today that would have an interest in an all day event um, to learn much, much, much more about this topic, um, June 15th um, would be the day. Any other questions? I think we have time um. for a couple more. Hi, so uh, my question actually kind of involves more of the environment. So my primary role um, in the School of Arts and Sciences is with space planning. And so when we are looking at classrooms, student spaces, even sometimes research labs, are there either resources or folks we could talk to if we are looking for ways to make those spaces more accessible or provide things like a chair that wiggles enough or a desk you can stand at it instead of sit, you know, like, I'm just looking for ways and things to just keep in the back of my mind to be aware of as we're, you know, renovating spaces or designing spaces, what should we be looking to include, or are there components that I might go, oh, that looks awesome, where somebody else in the room would find it so distracting that, you know, it, it's a bad thing to add to the space simply because it could limit somebody's ability to study work or learn in that space? Yeah, that's an excellent question. And so I think you're, you're, you're already going in the right direction knowing that there's not gonna be um, one universally effective approach to, to space design that is gonna be perfect for everyone. But just jumping off um, Elizabeth's earlier suggestion, um, surveying, asking people, and not, not just um, asking people in a way where you're also asking them to self-identify, um, but just proactively providing all of these things for everyone, not just people with autism or not just people who identify as neurodiverse, but saying these are resources that we're um, considering providing to everyone in the class who might like to use them. You know, which of these resources you know, might, you, might you think are beneficial? Because I'm not always planning a space for the people who are there. 
I might be planning a space that is going to be used for the next five to ten years. Mm -hmm. So are there resources within your, because not every designer or architect I work with has knowledge in this area. So are there resources either within your group or elsewhere at Rutgers where we could have somebody come and look at, this is what we're thinking of designing, do you have suggestions, you know, someone who's got more of that knowledge base. We, we would love to help oh. with the caveat that we're not funded by Rutgers, you know, in, in any way, you know, we, again, the, the program survives based on the fee that the students pay to be in the program. And that was, that's actually what I was, what I was referring to earlier. Like, I think that's where we need to go. And it's not just a Rutgers issue, right? It really is nationally, um, you know, issues facing students who are neurodiverse really aren't well enough understood, um, you know, from an ADA perspective. You know, this is really an issue of accessibility. And what we're referring to are accommodations for accessibility for neurodiverse people. Um, and again, we're, we're still really just starting this conversation. Um, you know, everyone in this room and otherwise in, in, in society is very familiar with the idea of curb cuts, um, you know, for people who have mobility challenges who might use a wheelchair of their primary mode of getting around, right? It's tangible, you can see it. This person needs this cut out of the sidewalk in order to get up. So, but we still don't really understand what all of the, the curb cuts are for people with, who are neurodivergent, right? And, and so I think um, where we need to go is, is, is kind of deeply exploring what we can do to impact those really startling statistics um, that I showed earlier um, in terms of a lack of college uh, completion or, or access. I mean, this is a research project, right? It's an empirical question, really. Like, what modifications or resources can we embed in learning environments that will have a meaningful impact on outcomes, you know, um, you know, for, for neurodiverse students. And so I, I would, we would love to do that work um, with your department, but we would have to find funding to support it. Yeah. All right, well, thank you so much. I know I, I'm not trying to cut everyone off, but I'm trying to be sensitive to the time. And so I think on the screen currently, we have some uh, more information and links for resources about how you can find uh, more information about how to support students, the newsletter, uh, emails for both of the folks that were our speakers today. And so for the folks who are in the room, if we could just give them a round of applause for giving of their time, <laughs> opening up their space. It was tremendous. I feel like I learned so much. And for the folks who are on um, the call, I think there may have been one more question. I think I saw a question over here. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Um, and so again, please feel free, if you have um, questions or you feel like there are things that you want to follow up with, please feel free to use these resources. I'm going to click one more slide here. Hopefully I'm going in the right direction. So again, the Equity Mindset Workshop Series is something that we're planning, we're, we're in, I guess we're treat about, thinking about what it will look like and take shape in the future. And so we always want to understand and, and hear from you about what that might look like in terms of format, how we're doing things, what do you want to hear about, who do you want to hear from. And so please feel free to go ahead and scan the QR code. There's also a Go Rutgers link, uh, go.ruckers.edu backslash ed equity mindset. Look at me, with no glasses on, I can see it all the way this way. So, <laughs> so please feel free to go ahead and fill out that survey. It gives us some perspective about how we think about for next year and what we can do. And so I think um, with that being said, I'll leave this slide up. I know that we're recording, and so these, um, the I guess the slides as a part of the um, talk as well as the recording of the talk will be available uh, on our website. And so from that perspective, you'll be able to uh, spend some time looking at it as a resource, but also you can share it with other people who maybe would be interested or could use this kind of information. So with that, I will say thank you so much for taking your time. Thank you to our speakers. Thank you for an impromptu guest providing a lot of good information. Um, again, thank you so much for taking the time. And with that, you are dismissed. For the folks who are in the room, I, I know the teacher in me goes, <laughs> you're dismissed. Yeah. Um, for the folks who are in the room, we do still have food out there, food architects food. I plan to get some more chips, you know, so just if you, if you haven't seen me out there getting no chips, just save a few for me, J just do that. Um, but again, please feel free to stay, chat a little bit, um, yeah, and spend some time. But again, thank you so much for coming. <laughs>